Hi, folks. So, Larry Reitman, are you there? Yes, I am. Bear with me. I've cut my headaches. Look, this article you sent me, I found interesting because I didn't know, and it puts things in a different light for me as well. We're talking about the Battle of Beersheba. Uh, you yes. write it was one of the most important battles fought in world history. Come on, justify that. Uh, I think I actually can. Um, uh, first off, uh, you have to realize the timing of it. Um, it happens in October 1917, uh, actually the very end. Uh, it's October 31st, two days after, comes the Balfour letter, publicly, you know, made oh, public in England. Oh, you're saying that the Balfour Declaration... Uh, is timed was... to it. It's timed to the Battle of Beersheba. Really? Um, yeah. Okay. Now, and um, the other thing is, is, is that uh, it's exactly 12 months to the day um, October 31st, 1918, that the Turks throw in the towel and sign an armistice. Right as the... Uh, that would uh, yeah. probably be a coincidence. No? Um, it, yeah, but also, you have to remember uh, that within inside of 12 days after that, the, um, the Germans signed their armistice. Because once they lost Turkey, they lost uh, not just their grain supplies, but also their oil and their chromium and tin supplies. In so, other words, when the Turks gave in, the Germans were finished. Th they were finished, yeah. yeah that, and the Turks and, gave in to the British, who captured Beersheba, on the 31st of October 1917, making it the underestimated Normandy of the First World War. Yes, that's right, yeah. Because what Beersheba did was, once they grabbed it, it, it was actually considered by the uh, many people that were experts in those days, really thought it was an impossible task. They couldn't do it. Um... But they did, and as soon as they did, one of the uh, things that they did was they suddenly were on the flank of the entire Turkish line. So no matter what the Turks did, the Australians were always coming out of the sun at dawn and just overwhelming. So, you know, uh, Ber Beersheba fought... Uh, fell on the 31st of uh, October. So there should be a monument in Beersheba, I guess like there's a museum on the coast of Normandy, to the most essential military battle of the First World War was fought in Israel, well, Palestine then, or whatever it was. It was fought at Beersheba. Well, y yeah, and you know, the interesting thing is the Australians are the ones who have the most information on this. Because they're well, the ones we'll, who actually we'll talk did talk about them. There's yeah. a side. Look, first of all, what bothered me about your report, and it was pretty, pretty well researched. I got to tell you. Look, uh, General Edmund Allenby. He was the one, the British officer who attacked Bersheven One, but no cavalry, no army could have got there without water, and it was. Jewish spies. That's well, correct, yeah. All right, just go yep. through who Aronson was. And by the way, I have trouble with this. I really do. Was he Australian? Uh, Aronson? Yeah. No, no Aronson was, uh, I think, uh, he came as a child, probably, you know, like a, a small boy uh, from Romania. Uh, his, How did he become the effective deputy minister of the Ottoman, uh, deputy agricultural uh, minister of the entire Ottoman Empire? Yes, Tell about the wheat and we'll... we'll yeah, we'll, well, w what happened was uh, Aronson comes to uh, the Eretz in, 
before the turn of the century. He grows up there. He uh, sent to French schools uh, by a Rothschild Foundation thing. And what was uh, the foundation's name? Um, oh, I, I can't recall right now. All we, right. Uh, but we get the connection. Yeah. But when you but, make that claim, I sure would like... All right, no, I mean, the, l listen, the, the Rothschilds were into a number of things. I don't even want to go there with them, okay? But okay. in those days, in the uh, 19th century, uh, they were the best Jewish hope. You know, they, they were among the best Jewish hopes that the Jewish people had. And... Uh, you know, yeah, the, it was a big family. It wasn't a small family, and they were they, they had various factions and whatever else. And that's a, that that in itself is a a program on its own. But Aronson happens to be one of the beneficiaries, and he winds up going to Harvard, where he becomes an agronomist, a scientific agricultural farmer. And he returns uh, to the land, and he establishes an experimental agriculture station. And uh, he starts uh, developing uh, an insight into the flora of, of the land. And while searching in the Mount Hermon region, he identifies a species that turns out to be an ancient species of grain that had been the main source of grain foods for Babylonian and uh, and he the couldn't Assyrian just Empire. get a medal. He had to be made an effective agricultural minister of the Ottoman Empire. Well, that comes later. Uh, is in 1903 he becomes famous for this grain discovery. And within side of several years, uh, the uh, whole. Uh, Asia Minor is becoming a breadbasket again uh, for for European buying of you know for making bread, and then um, in 1910 uh, he discovers this tree from Australia that uh, if it's in if it's planted in salt marshy areas, basically dries up. They it thrives in that terrain, and it uh, dries it up. Yeah, and like Chaim Weissman discovered a new kind of dynamite made from paint No, chips. no, 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 no. They, Gary, Barry, don't go there, because <laughs> it, it's, it's not that. But what happens is, is in 1911, the Ottoman Empire is hit by a series of locust plagues. And the locusts, it turns out, are really, they nurture and develop in these marshy, salty areas. And All right, he got rid of the mosquitoes. And he got rid Again, of the mosquitoes I, and the locusts. You, yeah. How does a mosquito killer get to be this tremendous spy well, at, the, that well, Allenby that. could not have won the Battle of Beersheba without this spy inside the Ottoman Empire. That's right, yeah. And really, you know, when the British tried to do it without him, they were getting pummeled. Well, um, no cavalry can... You know, horses need to drink. That's uh, right. He gave away the locations of, of wells and all kinds of stuff no, he, that he, made he, sure he, the Turks lost. Yeah, no, he, uh, there was no wells. Uh, near there, but there was several cisterns that had been built in Roman times, and and Aronson had mapped them. He when he was doing his flora studies of of the land, he came across these things. So he had he knew where they were. So it was then just a matter of getting the the cistern filled, and that's was what Edward Clater and, and a couple of other guys did uh, that uh, in September of 1917. They actually prepared these water Allenby would have moved without believing that he had a way to water his horses. That's right, yeah. And, and, and Aronson was the one who gave them where they could put that water. And it was along the route. Now, he got there, but 
what disturbs me about your report. Uh, all right. You know, I'm going to stick with Aronson for now, but we have lots of other discussions and a Jewish side to the First World War. Aronson, what you're saying, supplied Allenby. Well, uh, his with his sister Sarah, um, that, well... Well, there what, was actually... Uh, uh, every um, single gun emplacement of the yes. Ottoman Empire... Psychological uh, psychological reports on every individual officer. That's right. Yeah, that was really Sarah and Rivka. There was wasn't Aaron wasn't alone. He, he there was a brother Alexander. There was also um, Sarah, her um, uh, her fiance, uh, um, uh, Absalom Feinberg. There was uh, also. Um, uh, Rivka and both Sarah and Rivka had been trained as nurses in Europe. Sarah okay. was more than but a we're nurse. Talking about is a major spy network that changed yeah, the course yeah, really of World was, War One. But okay, yeah. Well, really, when when Aaron wasn't there, it was it was uh, Sarah that was really in charge of it all, and that's who. That, that's who uh, Allenby's intelligence officer, Meinertsen Hagen, actually meets. He, you know, he didn't really run in Aaron's, Aaron's in circles, but he wound up coming ashore, and it was Sarah who rescued him before the Turkish patrols found him. So, you know, but uh, anyway... Oh, I don't know. He, you're saying that Aaron Aronson the effective deputy agricultural minister of the Ottomans supplied yeah. the British Allenby with the topographical details, standard Ottoman but, procedures. Well, uh, 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 the Aronson Group, the, uh, n n you have to realize, in 1916, the United States is not in the war. And that's one of the amazing things about uh, the email I sent you, was all these pictures from the Turkish side. You know, and the very fact the United States was not in the war, the Turks did not want them in the war. And the Turks in 1916 send Aronson to America to uh, talk to his cohorts and to try to influence the American government not to become more involved. They knew they had a problem with the Armenian massacres, and so Aronson gets sent over to America with the blessing of the Kaiser and all the rest of it. And so he's out of the picture during the time that the battles are going on. But nevertheless, he set up a system where... Number one, as as the minister of agriculture, he has the Turkish army has to have food, and so he, he becomes responsible for where are these foodstuffs going to be stored and uh, and you know the logistics of, of feeding an army, and all that becomes his responsibility. So look, I, I don't want to. Uh, first of all, I have technical problems. You can't believe. But I'm getting this interview through, and I still have a problem. Wouldn't the Turks have found out that this Jew gave Allen the, the information to defeat them in this war? Wouldn't it have got back to the Germans? Yeah, you did. It okay. Did. Eventually, it did. Yeah. Yeah, no, eventually, the, I mean, uh, the, the Turks did find out, but it was already too late. And uh, Sarah was, uh, was was tortured and uh, then uh, basically did away with herself to prevent worse from happening. And uh, Rivka was imprisoned, and all, and all the people from Nilla and everything were tortured and imprisoned, and some Look, of them I, were I killed. I don't want to say this, and I don't want to justify um, anything about Nazis or Germans, yeah, but Hitler went crazy that the Jews betrayed the German nation. 
but they didn't. But you're supplying this evidence that they really did. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, um, the the Germans did not see, uh, and and they really put pressure on the Turks not to take it out on the rest of the Jewish community, uh, because they recognized that what was going on was was more a uh, a more enlightened stand against what their allies were doing to 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 innocent people and uh, you know you have to see this thing in terms of the perspective uh, you're seeing all these people that are they're said to be Armenians or they could have been Assyrians or right, they could have been Yazidis or the but they were Christians Weissman. He had an excuse for making dynamite out of paint chips. No, he I didn't. I don't buy that for one second. And I, I, uh, we went over this once before with you. Weizmann uh, had n- had nothing to do with dynamite. He had everything to do with the development of plastics and uh, and uh, What acetone. I'm saying is this yes. is the cover story. Well, it's not exactly a they cover story. They could care story, less but... about Armenians and Greeks. Yeah. The Aronsons didn't care. This is the cover story. I di- I disagree with you. As a matter of fact, I I, I, I see uh, in uh, several letters that uh, Aronson wrote at the time uh, to his German colleagues. He was very upset, and they were upset. But he came to the conclusion that the bureaucracy would not stand up to what uh, Enver Pasha had unleashed. These are the young Turks who slaughtered Armenians? That's right, yeah. All of this is going on. This is not happening in a vacuum. This is, this is not betrayal for the sake of financial gain or anything of the sort. This is actually a strategy for their own self-preservation. Because they know whenever they're finished with these guys, they're coming for them next. And Aronson and the family decided they weren't going to be next. They were going to help oh, the British it, it defeat makes them the... It look like they weren't who they were, which was spies and betrayers. Well, you, you want to put it that way. I mean, if, you, if you're a... Uh, a and many Turks today, uh, especially of the old guard, would exactly see it that way. But in a way, they wouldn't... Um, how can I say? If they would have had their real purposes, uh, an Altima would have never been made a deputy minister. All uh, right. So obviously, um, I'm more, uh, shall we say, cynical of what comes down to us as history, especially. My Lord, you've got Chaim, uh, Vi- not Weizmann, Herzog, writing uh, uh, about the Aronsons. Look, you may be right, but I could see a lot of people not happy that the, this Jew was supplying Allenby with the info to knock out the Germans. And, do, you, and do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I understand, but I also understand that's a very simplistic reading of, of the facts. Yes, it and is. And it's only when you start to realize that there were all these other variables in place that you then start to see maybe these people had another agenda, another intent here. And they, and they, and they had they had good reason I'm not to be go into to a be worried. They're going to Palestine in '37, speaking decent Hebrew and all this baloney. There's a world that we don't want to face, and I think we should. Well, uh, you know, uh, I I know that there's let's say uh, 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 hope of, of of what the world is or or let's put it this way a hope of what the world should be. And then there is that sort of gritty, dirty reality of what is the world. Now, here in North America, because we uh, we live with, 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 in a way, even our poor are wealthy compared to other countries of the world. But in essence, we live in a very, very sheltered and uh, 
um, affable life and place. And so, you know, we can oh, live with this, this sort of hope. I'm talking about you know? really a very, very good, deep spy network that the British explore. You know what? Tell people well, the British didn't build it. You. I'm sorry? First thing, before we go to commercial break for three minutes, tell no. people how to get a hold of you. Um, I can be gotten at um, www.truemetallic, all one word, oh, dot gosh, C-A. Cool. Spell it out once, just once. We're archived at libertyarchives.com for a week if you miss it. Spell it out. All right. Try it one more time here. Okay. Ours is www.truemetallic.ca. Wow. That's some... All right. We got it. Look, All when right. we get back, we're going to dive into the agent, well, you call them Nilly. Um, apparently, oh my goodness gracious, when you look at the Jewish Legion arrived on October 17th, and Beersheba fell two weeks later, something is going on. All right. Yeah, with the coordinating, but but you also have to remember it was in the planning for at least a year before. All so right, what look, Larry, appears? I'm what? having a technical problems all over the place, but I think we've got something important that we're talking about right now. We've got a, a Jewish side to the Battle of Beersheba that's really, really tied up with the British and really, really anti the Ottomans, which ultimately, according to what you said, means being anti-Germany. We've, well, we've no, the Germans, no, well, 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 it's not the same thing. It, it isn't. isn't? No. You have to remember, the Germans became allies of the Ottomans when the Russians started operations against the Turks in the Caucasus. Then Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire then enters the war on the side of Germany. Germany actually didn't, in the beginning, they didn't even want an alliance with the Ottomans. Well, let's say Beersheba didn't fall. Uh, would the war uh, uh, have been different? Very different, yes. Well, then we've yeah. got this issue all over yeah. again. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I guess, you, um, you know, I guess if you want to try dealing with this, you, you sort of have to see it in terms of the national interest of each of the players. So, for example, Germany. Oh, wait, wait. I'm okay. sorry, Larry. We have to take three minutes off. Uh, you're justifying something I'm, I'm not crazy about hearing. Uh, but neither here nor there. It is a reality. We'll be back in three minutes with Larry Reitman. This is Barry Chalmers, folks. Okay. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. 
Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Hi folks, we're off to our last half hour where I can sort of hear the show on Skype and I think I'm talking on phone, but my, is this show either bugged or hacked. Look, you get my books at lulu.com, www.lulu.com, right in my last name, Chammer, C-H-A-M-I-S-H. That'll take you to my books. My website is barrychamish.com. Next week is Christmas. We're taking a vacation. And why not? Who'd be listening in the middle of Christmas anyways? So we'll get the uh, Corsi Ben Menachem interview of the week before on next week. And now, Larry, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Who were Neely, N-I-L-I, who were Neely? Neely was the name that they gave to their, um, um, I would call it a a club, because at first it started just as a family with some of their friends. And then as it went on, uh, some more became involved, and... um, it doesn't really start until about 1915 or so. So it's it's already uh, Sarah has just returned uh, from uh, Europe via Constantinople and uh, witnessed and saw what was happening to the Armenians uh, across uh, Syria and Asia Minor uh, and. Uh, uh, Who is in Neely? Uh, this is a very nice background. Who was in Neely, and why did they choose to help the British against the Ottomans? Well, first off, you have to remember, in 1914, when the Ottomans go to war, the first thing they do is they expel many uh, uh, Jews from the land of Israel, and... Um, 
they they're they're expelled. They're 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 sent to Egypt, uh, especially those who had passports from uh, uh, powers that were at war with Germany. Um, so already there was a Jewish community in Egypt that very quickly made up what was called the Zionist Mule Corp that fought, you know, or, you know, that would go in, uh, to Gallipoli and, and help the uh, allies there. Um, so that's really the beginning of the Jewish Legion with uh, Colonel Patterson and, and this uh, 600 members of this uh, ammunition carrier band. Uh, and simultaneously, Aronson is a minister of agriculture and or deputy and and he's uh, he's put the Ottoman uh, country the the whole empire is in a surplus of food stuff. Uh, they're exporting it to Europe. They're making money, and um, and so yeah, the Germans would make him. Actually, the Germans insisted to Enver Pasha. They wouldn't go in as allies unless he was a deputy minister. Because I'm going to ask again. Yeah. Who? created Neely and who was in Neely and don't do this circle let's talk about Neely and uh, who was in Neely and well, where I, they were working for and I explained to you it is a family that then hooks up with others other Jews that are living there in the land that also have the same attitude they know that the Ottomans are not, uh, it doesn't look good. You have to remember, there was a guy called Hassan Bey that ruled, uh, the, was, was basically the police commander of the whole area. And, uh, and, and he, was a, he was a bully and a tyrant. Uh, so it, Nilla didn't have to really recruit very hard. Uh, a lot of people just were so ticked off at what Hassan Bey was like. So, um, but who, I can't give you all the names, uh, Barry. I know that eventually the Turks uh, had arrested some 160 or so, uh, and um, some were killed, uh, like uh, uh, Sarah's fi fiancé was killed trying to get to British lines by Bedouins. Um, so are you saying they were early Zionists? Well, they they were there before official political Zionism. Political Zionism starts around 1900. And uh, these folks, many of them, were there for decades before. I'm going to ask you straight out. Now, I've got problems of just hearing, but you're saying... A deal was cut where if the British get Palestine, we'll sign the Balfour Agreement. Is that right? No, no, no not exactly. I, I think I mentioned to you before Is about the French. Is part of it right? What? No, not, not at all. Um, really, the, uh, the Balfour Declaration is, uh, is a, a screen. The people who had all the legal rights in the in the Holy Land was the French. Oh gosh, that's all right. right. The uh, French had all the legal French. rights. Yeah, and the Where Americans are the knew in the Holy Land. Yeah, and the Americans knew that if they had problems or or business opportunities in the Holy Land or anywhere in the Levant, uh, they had to go to the French. They had to have French agents or or. Uh, you know, French uh, uh, notaries or whatever, you know, but so the French had that special status. And the only way the British were going to get it away from the French was they had to, the only people that had equal standing in a hypothetical, let's say, international court were the Jews. Because when the French got their rights, they had to co-author it with the Jews in 1535. So, so then 
that's when the British decide that, uh, well, no, the British Zionism started roughly in oh, the 1840s as a religious You're revival. The French are allied to the British in this yes. First World War. That's right. Really, you're saying are allied to the French, or where are the French? No, N N Nilla comes into existence really after the war is on. It doesn't start before the war. Whereas in the case of what was going to happen very early on, um, you know, before even Gallipoli, uh, the the British knew that they had to have something worked out with the French on, you know, future dividing of spoils should they win the war. So that really starts Sykes-Pico. I guess uh, that kind of explains. Um, as I say, people have got to get a hold of you. I'm not even sure what you're saying is right, but what you're saying is <laughs> Neely was working essentially for the Allies. That's correct. Yeah. Good. They were they were really they weren't working against the Germans. As a matter of fact, Sarah was adored by much of the German officers, and even the Turkish soldiers respected her because she was a very competent nurse. Her and uh, Rivka, the, her sister, were uh, were adored. Uh, the, 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 they were the types that came and, you know, visited the, a sick soldier and stuff like that and stayed by their beds. And All so, right, you know, they were the feminists of the time and she was caught yeah. by a pigeon, you say, intercepted, uh, which caused her to be uh, tortured and she That's killed herself. True. Yeah. That's, all right. Yeah. Let's but but when forget when, Aaron right now. We're talking about his sister Sarah. Sarah, yeah, who is really a, a remarkable character. Yeah. As a, as a matter of fact, the the chief of British intelligence actually dedicated a book to her. You know, he he was so taken with her. So I know. All yeah. right, we still haven't answered the big question. How did you get into Neely? Where did you come from? Why was it even... I didn't, you know, I didn't start out with Neely. I was actually just trying to find out uh, what, what was the truth behind um, uh, how was it that they were able to get Beersheba. You don't understand what Beersheba is until you really see the area topographically in every which way. And then you realize that this was literally the natural killing ground of an army. You didn't, you didn't need weapons to kill off an army at Beersheba. All you had to do was just, scarcity of water would do it. Plus, you know, loads of poisonous scorpions and snakes and whatever else out there, every rock. And add to that the state-of-the-art defenses that the Germans then designed. You know, it was, it was really seen as unbelievably impossible. All right, and, uh, uh, Larry, just so you know, um, I'm yeah. having amazing sound problems, but I think I caught that. Now I want to go into the Jewish Legion. By the way, they are absolutely immortalized in the mythology of Israel. The Jewish Legion, they were the British Army's 38, 39, 40, 41st, 42nd, 43rd service battalions of the Royal London Fusiliers. Yes, That was yeah. the Jewish Legion. And they were recruited in 1617 and went two weeks into, um, well, they went into battle uh, for Be uh, uh, for Sheva. Yeah. Go and, through this and the whole thing. Oh boy! Yeah, and and Go the incredible, through. the incredible thing, Barry, is is they weren't just ordinary soldiers; they were the tip of Allen B. Oh come on! If you had a Jewish army of the American army, here's your Jewish platoon. Yeah, uh, it it would stand out that they were Jews. Yeah, yeah. No, they they they, they were superbly trained, and. Uh, and the idea was was they had learned a certain technique on how to hunt down and destroy a machine gunner. 
And even, you know, if, if you saw one of these groups coming for you, even you with your machine gun, you were better off throwing the gun away or running away. That was, that, that, that was what these guys were actually experts at doing. They used it. It was a combination of a, a, almost like a cat-like hunt where men coordinate in tandem, and they literally use the version and everything. And, and before you know it, you're in their uh, you're, you're in the grenade throwing range. You know. Well, you and, quote uh, an Archibald Wavell, yeah. who said that they were the tip of Allen B. Spear. Spear, yeah. Well, how were they? Because once they took out the machine gunners, then the Australian light horse were free to roam. Horses don't do too well against machine guns. Nothing does well against machine guns. But when you got guys that are experts at hunting down machine gunners, <laughs> then the horses are great. <laughs> well, again, you say Jewish Legion scouts guided the New Englanders to within 30 miles of German no, uh, Turkish uh, trenches. No, 30 feet. They actually got within 30 feet of the trench where the Turks were built up in strength so that there was no distance when the Australians rushed in. It was like they just suddenly popped up in front of the Turks. Well, how did they know where this trench was? How well, did they the, know? This, the, 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 this was a thing that if if you were if you grew up in that country, and you knew the area, there were probably a couple of guys in that, you know, scouting squad, that actually knew the lay of the land. And if you know the lay of the land, you can, you know, you can be outnumbered fifty to one, and uh, you're going to come out on top. Because you, well, you, you actually turned the land into your me, weapon. What you're describing to me is yeah. their Sheva would, would have never fallen. That's right, yeah. Without the Jewish Legion, without Millie, and without the Aronson. That's right. There was no way Allenby yeah. would have captured the joint. That's right, yeah. But, and once he had Beersheba, like I said to you, it, 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 was, it, it just became... Uh, you know, just one thing after another. You know, uh, uh, they went from uh, Beersheba to, uh, on the first, they take Abu Hiru. On the second, they took uh, uh, Atwani. On the third, they took the fortress at Ali Muntar. On the fourth, they took Gaza. You know, it was, they just kept on, it was always after that, Wherever the Turks were, the Australians were always coming up their back. And as I said before, this was certainly yep. um, an unacknowledged Normandy with yes. the Battle of Beersheba. Yeah. And I don't know, again, if the plan was to get this Balfour de uh, Declaration. I'm not sure what was really... No, the really Balfour Declaration is a spin-off. It, it, it's, first off, it, uh, it, it sends a message to the Americans that the British are helping Jewish self-determination, which was a big deal for the Americans in 1917. So that was, uh, and so American now, public what about opinion... The German Jews who actually fought and died for Germany? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is you cannot see the Balfour Declaration in a vacuum. Because, in fact, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, met with uh, uh, several officials from the Zionist organization uh, about a year before. And, uh, and uh, that was one of the things Aronson was told to tell the Americans, was that Germany would look with favor and help obtain autonomy for the Jewish national home. Oh. So there were, uh, although the Germans didn't have it in writing, they had, uh, they had sent out feelers, and, and especially towards American Jews. In the case of Eastern Europe, you know, uh, the Jews were possession of the Russian Empire, and they were enemies anyway. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go into your war plan again. 
And I think we're telling in our own way. Uh, Excuse telling me for a, uh, one second. A different history than. Look, you're saying the British. Hear me out. I can't yes. hear you, so you have to hear me out. Okay. You're saying, again, you're saying the British realized they'd have to take Palestine to secure the Suez Canal. Um, first of all, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, they well, it was true. Uh, Barry, you have to remember, the Turks tried in 1915, and they also tried in 1916 to come out of Palestine and grab the Suez Canal. The other thing was, was that if they were really serious about going after the Ottoman Empire, Palestine was the front door. Once you kick open the door, then the 400-year-old empire comes crumbling down. So, yeah, they had no... Uh, uh, you know, at first they didn't want to do it. They thought Sinai would serve them. But uh, especially... Hello? Yeah, leave it be. It's My radio station is putting things over my phone. I don't know why. All okay. right, look. What is Samson Ridge? <laughs> Samson Ridge is a name they gave to uh, Kafar Nitzarim. And what is Kfar Nitzarim? Kfar Nitzarim was a, uh, was a mesa, uh, a, a table a tabletop mountain, like a tabletop hill. Was it, it, was, it, it stood up south, on the south side of Gaza. It about, was in Gaza itself? No, it was about 10 kilometers away from Gaza itself. And it was like a table, uh, a, a, a table uh, hill. And at the top, the Germans... Wait a second. You're saying Jews were in Gaza... Yes. In 1917, there was oh, a, before. A, a Jewish settlement in Gaza? That's right, 1898, yes. It was called the Pert Muller Date Plantation, and it was owned by a German company. All right, what is the Pert Muller? <laughs> oh, it was, it was named after some baron, and uh, they, uh, they, 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 the table had its own water well. So it had its own source of water, uh, the Artesian Spring. So they had a plantation. So You're they had talking dates. about labor Zionists, I assume. That, uh, no, they weren't labor. It was really uh, the, no labor Zionists at all. It was all uh, it was all uh, German capitalists. <laughs> really? Yeah, but German Jewish capitalists. Oh, what does that mean? What? What's because a they, German uh, Jewish Catholic? No, I said capitalists. Oh, capitalists. Okay, yeah. I got you. Again, we're doing this show. When the show began, um, I had no Skype. Now I do. Uh, but So I hooked up to the phone, and my producer, I think, is talking on the phone every now and then. Uh, but once again, you're providing a very good interview in spite of all these things. Look... You're talking about a, a very good German general in Beersheba, that's Kresenstein. Yes. Uh, what he said is the Jewish infant, uh, well, the Jewish legion, um, in essentially were the best darn soldiers, and they caused... No, them. no, he said that about the Australians. Ah, he said that okay. about the Australian soldiers. He, he considered them the finest he had ever seen. Yeah. All righty. Now, and, and, I'm and gonna, it, yeah. Now, uh, just bear with me. I got troubles, boy. But you, I'm going to quote you, which sums up your argument. And now is your chance. Here's your quote. In hindsight, the Battle of Beersheba is the pivotal point of history, <laughs> Boy, oh boy. and was the most decisive turning point in the Great War, and it shaped the world today. Now, come now, isn't that a bit of embellishment? 
the pivotal uh, point. Well, of you, the know, uh, I, I, you know, you know, it's, a, it's a, a person's opinion, and I make it really based on uh, some pretty sound judgment. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess the more interesting question is: is what if it would have been partial? If it wouldn't have been the victory that it was, that, you know, 800 Australian light horsemen uh, took out 4,000 well-armed defenders uh, with a total of 39 casualties. All right, and they won big time, but it, come on, it wasn't the pivotal point. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you have more of an uphill argument than I do. <laughs> it was a very important victory, and it's been very overlooked. Yes. And yeah. I'll bet you, under the table, it was not good for the Jews, no matter what you think. But I got well, my own reasoning. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, well, we can, you know, that's another story in itself, but... Uh, uh, I will say one thing. Um, in the long run, it did really work out to be very beneficial for for the Jewish people. Um, in, in I mean, in, in in the end, you know, after all, there is today a, a, a Jewish state in in the Middle East, and maybe tomorrow there won't be. Well, you know, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, but you know, so what? Uh, can also there may not be a United States next week. Who knows? You know, or may not be a Russia. I mean, today it's not impossible. But I would say to you, you know, in terms of the practical outcomes, I I, I think it was a remarkable achievement. Yeah. Would you explain that to your friend, the Cobber? Oh, uh, it's an Australian slang. Uh, Australians often call their buddies cobber. From? Me and my cobbers. Yeah, um, it uh, comes from Javer. You betcha. That's where it comes from, right? And if you went to Melbourne and you called someone a cobber, he'd know what it is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, really? uh, matter of fact, they'll tell you more about the Battle of Beersheba than I can. Because they've got all the records. Another thing that's amazing about this battle was the Germans had air supremacy. Oh, oh, Larry, I want to thank you. We had a good conversation. I, and I'm going to apologize for my problems hearing, but I heard enough. Uh, I think we did very, very well. Uh, next week is Christmas. I take a one-week vacation. Uh, you'll hear the Corsi and Basmanakam interviews. Thank you, Larry. I liked it. It was good. Okay, good. Thank you. Bye. Night all. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month. And you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25. Or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com.